you pay for things in two ways all the time, no matter what. And, and you're choosing by default. It's either time or it's either money. And if you don't want to pay in money, it's going to be time. And the, the, the difference is, you know how much money you're going to pay, but you don't know how much time you're going to pay. What is up, everybody? Welcome to episode 37 of Sales Stories in Real Life. This is the show where professional salespeople share stories about their memorable buying experiences. Today, we've got a very special guest. By the time this episode airs, it's going to be just a few days away from his birthday. Happy early <laughs> birthday. He is a financial planner who runs his own practice, helping people manage their money. Welcome to the show, Mondo Salavanti. We talked about a lot of awesome things pre-show, and it sounds like you had some real interesting experiences when you were looking for business coaching, Mondo. What uh, what happened there? Tell us. Yeah, yeah, man. So when I first got in business, I had three months that were like a drought, which I think a lot of people get into sales, they struggle early. And, and again, I'm a financial advisor, but basically sales, I'm building my practice. I have no support to do that. It's basically, I eat what I kill, so to speak, if you use an analogy. Um. So I'm three months in, sucked. Month four, awesome. Month five, awesome. Now I have a ton of cash and I'm like, where do I invest this? Because you always hear on online, whatever platform it is, YouTube, LinkedIn, whatever. Oh, invest in yourself. Oh, invest in your business, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, okay, let me find the business coach. And I talked to a guy, his name is Simon Graner. Shout out Simon, first coach I ever hired. Um, he's a financial advisor, specific coach to help them have a more efficient process, a more valuable process for their clients, but also charge accordingly for it. So I'm sitting with Simon and back then he, his service he offered was a course along with, I, I believe it was two coaching calls and it was $4,500. So I'm 22 years old. Sure. I had all of this cash, but I'm like, $4,500 is a little steep. I don't know. Like, like what, what am I really going to get back for this? And in that, in that time, you know, I, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I'm an open book. And I say this to Simon flat out. And I remember him saying some form of like, the return might not be immediate. It isn't going to be pay him 4,500 bucks. I'm going to get nine grand back in, in two days. But the skills that I'll gain from the course, from working with him, the insight I'll gain from him. And quite frankly, just because we don't know, what we don't know. And him being someone that was years ahead of where I was in the same industry, that's what I was gaining from working with him. And the way he put it to me, he's like, look, man, you get two clients, give or take everything else you gain from, from working with me for the rest of your life is, is an infinite return. And I look back on that. It was about two years ago to now. It was in like May of 2021, I believe. So almost two years. Um, and I did hire Simon. I worked with him, first coach I ever worked with. And I've probably made multiple six figures purely because of him to this point. So, and and, and again, that number is only going to go up as time goes on. Uh, but if I didn't take a chance and, and just trust the process there, you know, who knows what would have turned out. So, man. First off, shout out to Simon. Um, this is yeah. fantastic. This is the classic example of give a man a fish, feed him for a day and teach a man how to fish and, and you feed him for a lifetime, right? Like, especially with where you were at in your career, 22 years old, the amount of time that you can skip and get ahead of the curve and learn about those mistakes that other people had to go through that trial and error process for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. It's a bit of extra money. But the time you're saving and the ROI that you can calculate over the course of a decades long career uh, is pretty wild. So, I mean, like, what was that like for you when you're kind of in that place that you're pushing back on price, let's just say, and instead of like coming back at you and like, dare I say, like trying to manipulate you into the ROI, he kind of hit you straight down the middle of the plate or kind of square between the eyes, if you will of like, look, man, you just need two clients and everything else is gravy. Like what's, what's going through your mind there as a buyer, right? Cause obviously you're in a heavy, heavy skeptical place right there. You're in like your zone of resistance and then someone just hits you and calls a spade a spade. What's going through your head there? Yeah. So Simon, what he's very good at is asking questions. And I realized 
every time this guy asks me a question, I want to work with him more. And I think what that was, what that was, he was so interested in me that it made him interesting to me. And when he would ask these questions, it would not that they were leading, but it would naturally bring answers that I'm like, this only makes sense to work with him based on how I'm feeling from this question. So through that and and the almost like anybody that's good at sales, which I would consider Simon very good at sales. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Anyone that's good at sales knows it isn't about convincing someone to do something. It's about asking them the right questions to qualify them to do something. And if they're going to give you the answer that qualifies them, then you should push a little to work with them because there's someone that you can help and they will get value over what they're paying you. So I saw this in working with him and I'm like, at the very least, this guy's going to teach me to be better at sales and marketing. And if he does that, this will pay for itself probably 10 times over. And one point I just want to make off that, Alex, like, like I didn't realize this then, but I totally realize this now. And I talk about this a lot online. You pay for things in two ways all the time, no matter what. And, and you're choosing by default. It's either time or it's either money. And if you don't want to pay him money, it's going to be time. And the, the, the difference is, you know how much money you're going to pay, but you don't know how much time you're going to pay. So it could be 18 months, 18 years, whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, I look back and I'm really grateful I paid him in money because who knows how much time I still would have been paying. That's a that's a gem of a clip right there that will pull. And the the kind of funniest part about this is Simon's not the only not the only coach that you invested in, right? Wasn't yeah. there wasn't there some other stuff going on too? Yeah, man. I mean, I, I've worked with with a ton. Shout out to uh, Nishin Chen, she's amazing. Ali Rahman, she's amazing. Um, Justin Welsh, though, I I think everybody that sees this video probably knows who Justin Welsh is. Um, and Justin, I took his course a little under a year ago. So this was in July of 2022. And I got to this point, I'm, I'm two years in business. Business is great. You know, I have clients, but I sort of am like, I don't have a repeatable marketing machine. I don't have any way to gain, gain clients other than referrals and, and hoping that they come to me and asking for them. So I looked at LinkedIn and, and I was doing what everybody else was doing for two years before that cold pitching, reaching out to people. I don't even know. No, no success, of course. Um, take his course. I'm like, I don't know a thing. I'm going to do what he says. At the end of the course, like any good course creator does, there's an upsell. And he upsells me a coaching call. So I paid Justin $850 for a 45-minute session. And we talked business strategy, LinkedIn strategy. I just want to plug to like, great guy, such a good guy. Um, <clears throat> but what Justin taught me was like, you just need to be putting out who you are. Talk about the area you're an expert in. If you could tie those together even better and make sure if someone comes and looks at who you are on your profile or website or whatever, whatever, make it obvious what you do. Don't, don't make it a mystery. And, and if they need what you do, they will come to you eventually. So in so little words, that's what I got from working with Justin. And, you know, you fast forward eight months since that call in, in, uh, July slash August. So I guess seven, eight months. Now my business primarily comes from LinkedIn. I've signed 14 clients to my financial planning practice this year. Every single one of them is from LinkedIn. And it's not because I don't get business from people around me. It's just, I have so much demand from the platform that I'm grateful to have generated that I can pick and choose who I want to work with and who I really like to work with. So you want to talk about life changing. I mean, I paid Justin a thousand dollars. I would have paid him a hundred thousand dollars for that information, you know? So <laughs> Justin might be raising his prices after he hears this. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I love this because you, I'm not going to say they're the same service, but let's say they're similar services, right? It's, it's business coaching, but you kind of got sold on them in two completely different ways, right? Like, yeah. so that's so cool. You kind of had two experiences buying similar products, but you were sold them completely differently, mm -hmm. right? Simon, it was, it was direct, right? You guys were yeah. having a conversation. There was objections. There was rebuttals. Justin is out there every day, right? Top of mind in the feed all the time, constantly selling, constantly educating, you know, constantly being present. And yeah. so like, what would you say in terms of like the two, let's call it customer acquisition strategies that you got hit with, right? One was kind of a direct human to human sale. 
One was social selling in a sense, right? And then it was getting sold to a course. And then after the course, you get sold the phone call. And obviously, both of them turned out very well for you. But would you kind of speak to those differences for the folks out there that are trying to figure out a sales motion that works for them? So I think the two differences are Simon was selling me a service. Justin was selling me a product. And even though with Justin, it did end up being a service with the coaching call, I still viewed the coaching call as a product within the product I already bought. So it was an upsell. It's a little bit different Um, with Simon. Similar to what I do as a financial advisor, he's a finance, he's a financial advisor coach. So it was your, your typical free consultation discovery call, have another one, dive a little deeper proposal of how he'll help me. And then objections overcome close me. Um, the the differences that I see is on this side of things with Simon, you really need to get personal with the person on the other side of the table and understand what's truly burning inside of them, which at me at the time, it was, I just want to be a successful financial advisor. And I don't even know what I don't know. I was so blue in the face. I'm, I was five months in business and I'm like, I have money. I better put this to use before I look back, spent it and and then next thing you know, I'm not successful. So that's what happened there. And I think he was very good at pulling on those pain points, but reasonably pulling on those pain points that they were real. It wasn't um, fear mongering, you know? So th- I think that would be the major difference between the two. We are not a show that declares any ultimatums. We don't think anything's dead, right? Different strokes for different folks. So if you're out there and you're trying to figure out, hey, am I in more of a direct sales motion? Am I in a social selling motion? Am I in a PLG motion? Test it out and see what works for you. Obviously, Mondo is proof that you can, similar buyers can be sold by different techniques. Um, So there's no need to be all one way, all the other way. Find what works for you. And on that tune, Mondo, we got some B2B sellers that are listening right now. What would be the biggest takeaway that you would give to them? Yeah, I mean, I think whether it's B2B, B2C, whatever it is, I think the biggest thing in sales that that people don't do is they they don't set they don't set expectations. I think mm. this is where people fall short. So whoever your prospect is make sure they know what's coming next. And if they become a client, make sure they know what's coming next. If there's something that has to be done and it's taking longer, make sure they know that you're on it. With with my clients, you could ask any of them. They're going to tell you that they're never guessing what's next with me. They always know when we're talking next, or if we don't have something scheduled, they always know that I'm doing something behind the scenes and I'm on it. And I think there's a lot to be said about that from a buyer's perspective that you just want to know Hey, even if we're not directly moving forward with something or or constantly making progress, just let me know you're on it, you know? So B2B, B2C, whatever it is, I think that anybody could benefit from that. That's, I I, I love it. I have like 10,000 thoughts coming to my head right now because it's like, (laughs) it's so simple in a sense, but at the same time, not because I love these things that are like, get back down to the basics, right? Don't leave people in mystery and let them wonder what happens next because that's when people ghost. That's when people stop answering. That's when people cut off, right? Just because there's a darkness in the tunnel and they're like, wait, what am I even doing? Versus, Mm -hmm. hey, we're going to do this, then we're going to do this, and then we have our call on this day, and then you're going to do that. It makes it so clear and you're following a plan. You Um, know why people don't? And I don't want to cut you off, but I want to get this point in. People don't because we go back to qualifying how well... Simon, for example, qualified me to know that I was a fit for what he did. If you're not qualifying and you're moving past that, it's difficult to set expectations because you feel like a pest. You feel annoying. This is why people don't set expectations. And if you feel annoying, you need to ask yourself, do I feel annoying because I'm just scared to reach out? Or do I feel annoying because I don't know that this person is a fit for what I'm doing? And if I reach out, they're going to tell me that they're not interested anymore. That's what you need to answer to yourself. So, I'm so glad you cut me off to say that because that's such an important clarification. <laughs> And I'm even more glad because this is normally where we would cut, but we were having a really cool conversation pre, uh, pre-recording pre about how you got into sales. I'm not even going to give any teasers. Let, let's have the people here because this is a great story. <laughs> so so look, man, I'll, I'll try to get through it as fast as I could. But growing up, I was a sneakerhead. I'm still a sneakerhead. Like I still collect sneakers 
I'm, I'm 20, going to be 25. Um, and I'm in college. My best friend, he's my realtor, going to be the best man at my wedding. He starts flipping sneakers. This is like November of 2019. Um, and, and now you fast forward 2020, the pandemic hits it's April, the month after the, the original shutdowns. And he's doing awesome, like building through Instagram. And, and I text him, I'm like, dude, like, are you making money doing this? Like, like what's going on? He's like, yeah, dude, like, it's crazy. Like, oh, I, I'm buying shoes, buying them in bulk, buying them used. I'm fixing them up. I'm selling them. It, it, it's like clockwork. I'm like, bro, like, I know just as much as you, but like, I don't really want to step on your shoes. Like, like, what are you thinking? He's like, oh man, like there's like Supreme and all these other streetwear brands. Like you could flip clothes that that works too. So I start flipping mainly Supreme and Supreme for anyone that knows has drops on like, I think it's Thursdays if I remember. Um, So I would get the Supreme drops. I'd flip them, make money. Boom. Next thing you know, I'm buying Supreme secondhand off people. And they're like, oh, well I have, I have these shoes too. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's a good deal. Like I got to take that. So then I start selling shoes and I go to, to Jarrett, shout out Jarrett. Um, I said, dude, like I'm getting these sneaker deals. I'm not trying to step on your toes. I just want you to know I'm doing it. And like, great on him. He's like, dude, we could both eat, like do it. Let's go. Like we'll build together. So I I did. And that was in, in like May slash June of 2020. Fast forward. I'm, I'm flipping shoes all summer, all through the fall, my last semester of college, all the way up to November. And I look up and I'm, I'm doing my taxes with my accountant the next year. And I'm like, I did like 120 K in revenue sold almost 400 pairs of sneakers and granted profit margins aren't crazy. They're about 15%, but making 15 K in six months, uh, flipping shoes in college, man, that was a ton of money. So the crazier part comes next though, because my last month flipping shoes, I said, I, I sold almost 400. I sold like 130, 140 my last month. And it's like, all right, I'm done now. Like I'm going to go be a financial advisor. So Graduated college, started doing this in December of 2020 and put shoes to the side. So I take those skills and I look back and I realize they translated over to this very well. And I I was the fastest growing advisor in my firm's history in my first year. And now in my third year of business, going great still. Everything is only on the up. And and this is really only the beginning. I think I'll look back three years from now and so look like the infancy of my business. So I love that because I fell ass backwards into sales too. And I I said the same exact thing to you pre-show and I'm going to say the same thing now. One could look at, Hey, this industry is low margin and you know, so whatever I made, blah, blah, blah. But you got an MBA, right? In sales, like you're working with the supplier, you're marketing the product, you're reselling it. That is the kind of experience that you cannot pay for. So I love that story so much. I'm really glad we got to squeeze it in. We, we got squeezed in three stories. So this is yeah. another another three for one episode. I know uh, Jacob Carp had a three <laughs> for one episode. So if you haven't heard that one, go back and listen to it. Uh, but Mondo, this has been absolutely fantastic. Obviously, you're working on a bunch and you talked about what you're doing a whole lot. Why don't you plug something with the audience before we jump? Where can people find you? Yeah, first and foremost, Alex, just thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Grateful to be here. And uh, I mean, you can find me on LinkedIn. I just got on Twitter recently, going to do more there. Um, and I'm on Facebook as well. So Mondo Salavanti the third, follow me anywhere. Other than that, I don't have anything to ask for. Hope my content helps you out. Follow Mondo on in, uh, on LinkedIn. Find him on Twitter. The Twitter account is new. Uh, Mondo, this has been an absolute blast. Thanks for the time. Sales stories in real life, fam. We'll see you next week. Cheers. Thank you.